Grace and peace to you from Onalaska First United Methodist Church. You found our sermon podcast. We hope you enjoy. The first scripture reading comes from First Cain, chapter 5, 1 through 5, and chapter 8, 1 through 13. Now King Hiram Otar sent his servants to Solomon. When he heard that they had anointed him king in place of his father, for Hiram had always been a friend to David, Solomon sent word to Hiram and said, You know that my father David could not build a house for the name of the Lord, his God, because of the warfare which, he in a, which his enemies surround him until the Lord put them under the soles of his feet. But now the Lord, my God, has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor misfortune. So I intend to build a house for the name of the Lord, my God. As the Lord said to my father David, your son, whom I will set on your throne in your place, shall build the house for my name. Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel and all the heads of the tribes, the leaders of the ancestral houses of the Israelites, before King Solomon in Jerusalem to bring up the ark of the covenant of the Lord out of the city of David, which is in Zion. All the people of Israel assembled to King Solomon at the festival in the month of Athenon, which is the seventh month. And all the elders of Israel came, and the priests carried the ark. So they brought up the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with him before the ark sacrificing so many sheep and oxen that they could not be counted or numbered. Then the priest brought the ark of the covenant of the Lord to its place in the inner sanctuary of the house, in the most holy place, underneath the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread out their wings over the place of the ark so that the cherubim made a covering above the ark and its poles. The poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place in front of the inner sanctuary, but they could not be seen from the outside. They are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tablets of stone that Moses had placed there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites. And when they came out of out of the land of Egypt. And when the priests came out of the holy place, a cloud filled the house of the Lord so that the priests could not stand to minister because of the cloud. For the Lord of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. The glory of the Lord filled the house of the Lord. Then Solomon said, the Lord has said that he would dwell in thick darkness. I have built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell in forever. A word from God, from the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. All right, so I was thinking about the, the English language as I came up with this sermon or as I was ruminating on this sermon and and designing the bulletin cover. Y'all are probably looking at the bulletin cover going, what in the world does this all mean? But I was thinking about the English language, how uh, I've been told that it's one of the hardest languages to learn uh, if you're not uh, a native English speaker, if it's not been your first language. And part of that may be because we have these things called homonyms. You know what a, a homonym is? All the folks that remember their school, right? A homonym is a, a word that has multiple meanings, okay? So let's have some fun with some homonyms. I'm going to tell you some really bad jokes. 
that use homonyms, okay? Why did the cat come down from the tree? Because it saw the tree bark, right? The homonym there is bark, okay? Why are movie stars so cool? Because they have so many fans. Do you hear the homonym? See, if you didn't know, we think it's funny, but if you didn't know, why did the teacher wear sunglasses? Y'all should get this one. This is an oldie. Because their students are so bright. All right, that's enough of those. (laughs) Homonyms, homonyms, words with multiple meanings. The sermon title today is Making Concessions. The word concession is a homonym. Now, when I hear the word concession, my mind immediately goes to those overpriced hot dogs and popcorn at the ball game, at the movies. I don't know why, but we pay $10 for a small bag of popcorn at the movie. Why do we do that? Why do we do that? Concession stands. That's what I think of when I hear the word concession. But there is another definition for concession. That definition is... A thing that is granted, especially in response to demands. A thing conceded. Okay? Now, that's not where my mind goes when I hear concession. I think of paying too much for a hot dog. But that is another definition. And so, reading this text this week, I'm wondering, does God, according to that definition, does God make concessions? Does God ever concede or grant the wishes of others. And I think scripture, particularly this one, tells us that God absolutely does make concessions. Now we've got to back up just a bit and and join the the missed part in our story because we're following the story of God's people. And last week we saw young David He was anointed by Samuel. He was the runt of the litter. Samuel went to Jesse's house and had all the sons walk through. And then little David comes by and God says, this is the one because I'm looking at the heart. And what was it about the heart of David? It was breakable, right? It wasn't that it was flawless or somehow better than others, filled with faith. It was breakable, okay? David is anointed. Eventually, he became king. And... David did a better job than Saul in some respects. His heart was breakable, but he made some serious mistakes, and the mistakes that he made had uh, damaging effects and long-reaching effects even into his own family that, that haunted him and his family for years and years and years. Well, David, once he's established as king, he, he built a nice palace uh, of cedar and he was sitting in his living room and probably had the Astros game on. I don't know. And he had this thought. He thought to himself, now, wait a minute. Here I am living in this nice palace and the Ark of the Covenant. This is the the place where they believe God's presence met and, and dwelled on earth with the Ark of the Covenant. It's in a tent, the tent that Moses had built and moved with the people through the desert as they were making their way toward the promised land. They kept the ark in this tent. And David says, wait, wait, wait. We're in the land now. I'm settled. Everybody's settled. I'm living in a nice palace. And yet the ark of the covenant is still in a tent. This is not right. And so he concocted this plan that he was going to build this grandiose temple for God a permanent structure for God. And a word came to David from the prophet Nathan. And God said, wait, 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 wait. I never asked for a temple. From the day that I met y'all, I have been dwelling in a tent, moving from one place to another. I have been perfectly fine living in a tent. I have never asked for a temple. However, if you decide you want to build a temple... You are not to build it. Your son who comes after you will be the one to build it. I never asked for this, but I will allow it. That is a concession. That's a concession. And this is exactly what happens in our story that we read today. Lorene uh, read the story. Solomon 
second generation takes over. He is now king. His father David is dead. Solomon is experiencing uh, peace, uh, peace from enemies. There's no warfare happening. Um, in fact, the scriptures tell us that the people were as numerous as the seashore. So you get a sense that the, the promise that was given to Abraham in the very beginning is really kind of becoming fulfilled. The people are as numerous as the sand on the seashore. They are living in peace and prosperity. They have a wise king who is ruling over. And Solomon says, it's time to build that temple for God. It was a seven-year building project. Uh, Jim, did you put the slide in? Do we have the picture of the... Can you pull this up? This is an artist's rendering of what it may have looked like. So you can see, right, the, 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 the townspeople, what happens is kind of down and then this grandiose temple up on this hilltop. It, it kind of reminds me of like, uh, I don't know, like Zeus's temple up on the mountaintop or something. This is just a rendering of what it, what it might have looked like. And on move-in day, when it's time to move everything into the temple, the tent that was wandering out in the wilderness, the Ark of the Covenant, all the utensils, all the things needed for worship in the temple, on the day that it's time to move it in, they move it in with sacrifices. So many animals are slaughtered, they can't even count them. Music, dancing, fanfare. This is a huge celebration. And it's like they're saying, see God what we have done for you. See what we have built for you, God. But who's really giving the gift here? Who really needed the temple? Was it God or was it the people? Solomon seems to have a, a sense that this is more about them than it is about God. On one hand, he says, Oh God, I have built a place for you to dwell in forever. But then when it's time to dedicate the temple, he prays this beautiful prayer. And in that prayer, he says, but will God indeed dwell on the earth? Even heaven and the highest heaven cannot contain you, much less this house that I have built. So Solomon seems to have this understanding that this really is more about us than God. He seems to recognize or to remember that this was a concession on God's part, that the temple is what the people wanted, not what God wanted. But God concedes and God fills this man-made structure with just a pinch of his glory for now. He concedes. This is not the first time that God has made a concession for his people or for people in general. If you think back all the way to the, the very beginning in the book of Genesis, Adam and Eve are in the garden they mess up, and God says, you can no longer dwell in the garden. We can talk about why that was the case. I think that was an act of mercy, but you can no longer dwell in the garden. So they move out of the garden, and they begin to have children. They have two sons, Cain and Abel. Cain and Abel decide they want to bring a sacrifice to God. Now, Cain brings some fruit from his garden. Abel brings an animal from his flock. They bring this sacrifice to God. And this is really, really important. This is really important. Even though God never asked for a sacrifice. God never asks for fruit from the garden or from an animal from the flocks. But they bring it anyway. And much later in the wilderness, as they're going through toward the promised land, God finally concedes and says, look, if y'all are going to offer sacrifices, here's how I want you to do it. And they get very specific instructions on what can be sacrificed, what cannot be sacrificed, how they are to sacrifice it, who can offer the sacrifice. Later they will see where the sacrifice needs to be made. All these instructions. But God never asked for it in the beginning. God never asked for it. It's a concession. We've already seen in previous weeks how the people wanted a king to rule over them. All the nations around us have a king. We want a king too. 
even though God said, but I am your king. You don't need a king. I am the one who leads you and guides you. Nevertheless, God concedes and says, if you all insist on having a king, I will be the one to pick him out and I will be the one to tell him how he is to rule. And now we have David and Solomon who desire to build a temple for God, a permanent structure in which he can dwell and God concedes with specific instructions that David was not to build it, but his son could. Do you see a pattern here? Do you see a pattern? The people say they want something. God concedes and then gives careful instructions on exactly how he will permit the wishes of the people. Now, there's a couple things about concessions we need to know. First of all, God's concessions are concessions. It's pretty important. They're concessions, which means... They may not be permanent in the way that we think they ought to be. Which leads to the second thing we need to know is that concessions too often, given enough time, we forget that they were a concession. Given enough time, we flip the narrative and all of a sudden we deceive ourselves into thinking that we are the ones doing something great for God, that we are the ones offering a gift to God, we forget that it was a concession on God's part to begin with, that he never asked for it. And before you know it, that which is a concession becomes an idol in our hearts, a sacred object or institution that absolutely cannot be touched, cannot be criticized, cannot be altered. And the temple became that for God's people. You see, in the time of Jesus, the temple literally had become a concession stand. Not only was it, con- was it a concession on God's part, it became a concession stand. People exchanging currency for a fee so that people could pay the temple tax. People selling overpriced animals for sacrifice. And Jesus comes in and says, no. No, 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 no. No. He needs to remind the people, you need to remember this was a concession on God's part. Not only are you mocking the place where God has gifted you with his presence, but you have forgotten that God cannot dwell, at least not completely, in houses made by human hands. Just like Solomon said, way back when he dedicated the the temple in his prayer. Can God really dwell in this place that we have made for him? You see, God dwells in Jesus. God dwells in you and me. God dwells in people made in the image of God, Genesis. God makes people in his image. Why? Because this is where the living God dwells. A lot of scholars will tell you that this was the final straw for Jesus. Going into the sacred cow of the temple with a whip of cords and turning over money tables and driving animals out. Final straw, Jesus. You have upset us enough. And that this really is the thing that led to the death of Jesus. Because he dared to imply that the temple may not be as important as y'all want to believe it is. In fact, Jesus put an end to all of the concessions that we have mentioned this morning. Jesus becomes the sacrifice to end all sacrifices. Jesus is anointed and exalted of the king, as king of all kings. And he becomes the chief cornerstone of the true temple of God, the church. But this is too much for some people to accept. 
And so they crucify him. You see, when our sacred institutions and our structures are challenged, we fear the truth. We fear what it says about us, where we have placed our hope and our faith. It challenges us. It threatens us with loss. And our fear then turns to anger and to hate and to violence. It's interesting because I think the Apostle Paul probably got this quicker than anybody else. In Acts chapter 17, he ended up in the city of Athens and he enters into a debate with some philosophers. And in this debate, he says, The God who made the world and everything in it, he who is Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in shrines made by human hands nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. And while God has overlooked the times of human ignorance, now he commands all people everywhere to repent, to change the way they think about this, because he has fixed a day on which he will have the world judged in righteousness." God has overlooked, or as the King James Version says, has winked at human ignorance. Aren't you all precious? God has winked, but it's time to grow up. And I wonder, I wonder, what concessions has God made for us, the church, in 2021? What has God overlooked for our sake Well, aren't you precious? What have we deceived ourselves into thinking must be permanent aspects of the Christian faith? I'm hesitant to name certain things because I don't feel like being crucified today. (laughs) But I think we can name some general things maybe that we can take home and just think about. What about our buildings? What about our ministries? What about our programs? Well, you know, Pastor, we've had that program since 1925. What about our worship style and structure? What about our beliefs? What about our political ideologies? What about the way we live our lives? Are any of those things concessions from God? How would we react if those structures were challenged or changed by circumstances out of our control, and yet here we are in 2021 and COVID has done that. I wonder if God is helping us to grow up through COVID as our conventions change because they have to. I tell you, Two years ago, we didn't have screens on these walls. When we brought up the idea, it was one of those things that was not up for debate. COVID forced us. We now have people on Facebook that cannot be here, and this is the only way that they can see and hear. And so we were forced to put screens up. I could give you lots of examples. I thought, I'm deviating from my notes now, but I I, I thought about how 50 years ago, 100 years ago, the institution of the pulpit and the chancel was a boys only club. (laughs) And God finally said, it's time to grow up, folks. Because I have given my spirit to women as well. Amen. <laughs> How will we react when these things that we think are so important are suddenly challenged? You know, as God's people, we are not meant to be peddlers of 
cheap trinkets and cheap novelties and cheap ideas. We are not called to cling to human inventions no matter how important they are to us. You want to know what the crux of Christianity is? I'm going to give it to you right now. This is it. This is it. Number one, we are called to put our trust in Jesus Christ alone. Not Jesus plus. Whatever you want to add to that. Not Jesus plus anything. Jesus Christ alone. That's it. Number two, Jesus says that we are to be flexible and to flow like the wind as people who are led by the Spirit of God. You never know where the Spirit comes from or where it is going, and so are the people who live by the Spirit. And number three, and this is what Jesus laid down for us. This is it. We are to show our love for God by loving our neighbors and our enemies, period. Period. That's it. But that leaves a lot of stuff untouched. I'm not going to mess with any of that today. (laughs) But I do want us to think about that this week. What are some things in your life that if they were taken away, you don't know how you would move forward? I tell you, when the Romans finally toppled the temple, there were folks in that first century that said, life is over, that's it. There is no way forward from here. You cannot have a faith without a temple. And yet God's people have continued to expand and to grow and to move out into the outer parts of the earth. What are those things that you think, without that, all hope is gone, all life is gone? Go back to this. Trust in Jesus. Be flexible like the wind by the power of the Spirit. And love God by loving your neighbors. May we be those people beginning today and moving into a new year. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen.